Hello. Continuing on, I thought it would be fun to go in detail on something I mentioned before. Namely, in part 1, I quickly mentioned nuclear power for mechs, and how, given the restrictions and limitations mecha have, it's pretty vital as a power source to make it all work. So today, that's the goal. We will explore the nuclear option in regards to getting juice into that big robot. Now before I go any further detail, I do want to note that none of this would be possible without the help of a very smart guy. Garrett B is a licensed nuclear engineer and also present on the Tough SF Discord. He works with, specifically, laser-induced fusion and particle accelerators. After seeing part 1, he said he would be interested in helping out with his expertise, which considering his field of, well, expertise, his laser-induced fusion reactors, seemed like basically the perfect guy for the job. So big thanks to him for getting the research together. I'm serious, his notes have a whole work cited section, it's, it's very impressive. So, nuclear power. That is, fusion and fission. It's pretty complex stuff. And while a more modest video might try to just show one theoretical working reactor, we're gonna take a look instead at many options. Because there's a whole lot of different ways to do fission or do fusion or just generally use nuclear power. To highlight things, we have three hangars, inside of which are three different mechs. For each, we will look at all the nuclear options to really show off the wonderful world of our good friend, Grinning Doug Fusion. I don't know why I am a cowboy, but I am very hot, and it hurts. Also, EFL. Let's get started. Inside Hangar 1 is... Oh, oh, down there. Well, by mecha standards, this machine is a bit small. But it is one of the original pillars that founded Mecha, the nuclear-powered armor. Now I don't mean that newfangled slimware Master Chief BMX paintball armor spray-painted green. I mean the original, the two-and-a-bit-meter, two-ton steel gorilla starship trooper. Bulky, but strong. So naturally, the ultra-realist type goes, Aha! The most practical Mecha. Why, it's not even really a Mecha. This will be easy. Its power demands are not too high. And it's not hit by all those nasty square cube law problems, right? So the power supply here should be easy to do, right? Wrong. Mm. Uh, but it's not too big though, I, I thought... Wrong. Mm. The real answer is when it comes to nuclear power, this kind of size sucks. It's a real damn tough situation. To understand why, we need to deal with maybe one of the most important things with nuclear power. Scale. As you've probably noticed, our world is governed by pretty strict physical laws. As a part of that, things change depending on kind of what size they are and how embiggened or unembiggened they get. For example, an ant is a pretty good shape, and its size and layout is pretty solid for, well, being ant-sized. It can lift many times its own weight. This ant could pick up a 1mm by 1mm block of wood quite easily. So what if we made the ant human-sized? Could it still lift up its own weight? Could it lift up a one meter cubic block of wood? Take 10 seconds to consider this problem. Okay, now the answer. The ant is dead. It, it died. It specifically asphyxiated because the spiracles, the openings on its body it uses to breathe, work really great at, you know, ant size, but now its body is too damn big. So it doesn't really get enough oxygen into its internal volume. It choked and unfortunately died within about a few minutes of it being enlarged. Now I know you probably expect it to curl up, but its once light and tough exoskeleton is now heavy and its muscles are not even large enough or strong enough to properly move it. Oh, and yeah, it could not pick up the wood, by the way. Not because it's dead, because uh, it proportionally no longer is as strong because of square cube. Now, the smart viewer might say, Oh, I see Archonvolt. It's like the Mecha. It has a hard time scaling up and getting bigger. Just like nuclear power. Are they right, Grinning Doug Fusion? Heck no. And that is why it's hard to make power armor nuclear powered. Because nuclear is the opposite. It's the inverse. Nuclear energy loves to scale up, and friggin' hates to scale down. It's one of the main reasons we, for example, have nuclear power plants, but we don't really have nuclear cars. This is because of a number of reasons, namely. 
There's complexity. Nuclear runs best when each of its components have a lot of nice room to run well. It's hazardous. If not handled responsibly, radioactivity, you know, can cause a lot of problems. And it needs shielding, which of course needs space and weight, to properly absorb said radiation. It's also somewhat expensive because you need to kind of set it up all properly and so it runs at its best. So with all that in mind, we can now return to the issue with the Starship Trooper Man. Given a backpack with a 27 by 27 by 90 centimeter space, and asked for some kind of nuclear power, both fission and fusion are straight up just too big. Either for fission or fusion, even for getting any radiation shielding and a, basically having a suicidal pilot, the required machinery is its just a bit too large to make it fit. So what do we use? Well, we quite simply use an Exomer photovoltaic radioactive battery. And I know, that sounds like Star Trek Technobabble, so let me explain the concept. In a pressurized tank, you begin by filling in a gas form radioactive isotope, like those of uranium or plutonium. From there, you add in the Exomer part. This is basically an excitable gas, like xenon, around which you wrap a protective lining and, most importantly, a specifically tuned photovoltaic. Now these are more typically called solar panels, but there's no sun here and it's not needed. The way that it works is, the radioactive gas decays. The energy from this decaying gas excites the excimer gases. Those gases, like a five-year-old hopped up on sugar, then emit, or vomits out, a photon. That photon then hits the photovoltaic, which, if you hear the name, turns photons into, bingo, electrical power. Wow, and it produces a lot of power. Ideally, potentially megawatts of juice. Wow, this is fantastic. Are there any real downsides? Yes. Firstly, the xenon starts to decay after about 9 hours. That on its own is okay, you can just pump in more xenon as your fuel, more or less. But it does take away one of the biggest long-term advantages of nuclear energy, that being its potential for years or decades of constant power. With this baby, you gotta refuel. If your guy takes a hit to the power plant, it also explodes in a ball of blue, then dissipates. This is visually very cool. You can also add scary chemicals to boost power, and stretch how long you need to go before refuelings. But also, if the battery explodes, everyone nearby dies painfully. I'm not joking, he said that right here in the notes. So yeah, very carefully and with delicate precision, this works pretty well for our powered armored man. So let's move on to the next mecha. Inside hangar number two is... Dugram. This one I chose more so because I know it's powered by something nuclear, and it's in a good, more reasonable mecha size. Now automatically, we have more room to work with, so things start to get a little bit easier. We can begin to consider the real, actual nuclear option of actual fusion or fission. So we have, say, about 100 tons of total weight, setting aside around 20 to 40 tons for its central power supply, in terms of mass. But now, it, it's time to get to the nitty-gritty part of nuclear energy. See, it's not just enough to make power, or make power for a while, you, you generally don't want to kill the people using the vehicle. And this is the real tough bit. So if we went with fission, we could absolutely power Dugram, with about 20 tons of nuclear radioactive shielding. We would ideally want an MHD, a Magneto Hydrodynamic Generator. No, not the Red October one. That was, that was just a pump jet. This lets us directly convert the energy from thermo into electric with a minimal use of moving turbine blades at high efficiency. Great, tens of megawatts of juice, and it can fit. But it's time to deal with the nasty side of fission. Mainly it's radiation. See, that shielding does work to make the dugram usable, but just because it won't kill you instantly doesn't mean that it's safe. It will still passively be poisoning everyone nearby, and Kryn Kashim, our lovable gorilla pilot, only has about 24 hours in the saddle before the dose of radiation gets to him. And that is with the fact that a lot of that radiation shielding is going to be focused directly for protecting his use. Ah, so now we come to the classic mecha power source, fusion. Ah, Argonbolt, that's right. Fusion is hard to do, but if possible, it's clean energy. Are they right, Grin and Doug Fusion? It's in your name. What do you think? They are sort of right. But also not. Yeehaw. See, fission is the process whereby radioactive elements are split 
using the bombardment of neutrons, creating a runaway process known as criticality. It's self-perpetuating and makes heat that thing that we can actually use to turn into power, but also radiation. Fusion, on the other hand, is more tricky, and involves instead trying to get energy out of forcibly combining two elements together. It could potentially give us a lot of power, but its complications have been giving us a real hard time in real life. Namely, well, we have done it. Hooray! We have not done it in an energy-positive manner. Boo. In a nutshell, you need to get two of the right substances very, very fucking hot, and also hold them in a very stable state long enough for them to fuse. Fusion itself as well, while generally cleaner, isn't magic. Depending on what two elements you are trying to fuse, you will get possible radiation or even a shitload of neutrons. So for example, tritium-deuterium fusion, an actual fusion process we have achieved, produces a lot of neutrons. Like, m more neutrons than real usable thermal energy at points. Deuterium-deuterium is better, but it still releases about half of its energy as neutrons. Deuterium helium-3 is theoretically insanely efficient, but it's also even harder to do, not perfect, and still produces a quantity of neutrons and radiation. So the ideal fusion is a pure, more efficient, aneutronic fusion, or basically, one where no energy is wasted by becoming neutrons or radiation, and as much as possible is focused into thermal, hot, usable energy we can convert into power. So the quest for fusion is really, in fact, more like three quests. Energy-efficient fusion, in whatever shape that might take, theoretically cleaner or more efficient forms of fusion by fusing more exotic or specific forms of matter, and then the final quest, fitting that all down into a usable form for a power plant or some kind of reactor for a vehicle. For our Dugram, at least, if we squeeze the machinery into the chest and backpack, we might just be able to get away with a potentially deuterium-deuterium reaction, and with some shielding for this far less bad radiation compared to fission. Kryn can comfortably pilot the Dugram without needing to take a thyroid and colon cancer test every 10 minutes. And if he gets a slightly better, slightly even nicer form of fusion, something like boron-11 and a proton fusion, then even if it's a little larger in machinery, it should be theoretically completely clean. And so, that brings us to our final hangar. Mecha number three, which we now see is... Giant Turbo! Come on, how could I not? Nuclear energy is so central to the day the Earth stood still, and Robo's nuclear power supply in the plot is a kind of a huge deal. I mean, come on, they, they store him in a giant cooling tower, how could I not touch on this? It's too good. Now when it comes to power supply, I, I will get into fission, but Robo is so goddamn big that he could easily fit a fusion unit if they felt like it. Using proton-boron-11 fusion in a Z-pinch, or magnetic mirror setup, Robo's fusion power plant could produce around 900 megawatts per second. Or, in perspective, enough power to keep the lights on in every home in St. Louis while being effectively safe to walk around with no real radiation hazard. Because fuck it, Robo has like 100 tons set aside just for shielding if necessary. The weight of the Dugram, entirely just in the shielding mass budget alone. But what about fission? What about what we actually know powers giant Robo in the show? Simply put, it works. That is, that's all there is to it. It also pushes the output power into the gigawatts per second range. Robo has mountains of power, effectively the same as a full-on nuclear power plant, in his chest, ready to go. And this is the funny thing about how nuclear power scales up. On the surface, some tactical western mech seems way more realistic next to Giant Robo, but at least in terms of the technical realism of the two using nuclear power, Giant Robo is more realistic when it comes to having just the mass and space available to actually, you know, get it working. Giant Robo basically has a chest cavity even more bountiful in reactor space than some submarine reactor compartments have to deal with. And here, while we're on the topic, I want to give some big gold grinning Doug Fusion stars to the Jaegers from Pacific Rim as well as a jet alone. Just for being cool nuclear titans, but also for doing some fun stuff with nuclear power and giant robots. Jet alone has its gigantic control rods right built into its design. It's really hilarious. And the Jaegers, oh baby. 
You fight in the ocean, so naturally you take in seawater as a secondary constant cooling loop. Just like a real nuclear sub. Very fucking cool. And now, speaking of subs and water, you see, one of the main reasons subs adopted nuclear reactors was to go on patrol for months on end. These reactors have lifetimes in the decades. That means tens of years without really ever needing refueling. Just constant maintenance here and then. What this means is that Robo as well could be effectively powered for, I don't know, 60 years non-stop? Now what's also interesting, and also related to submarines, is that while water is great, and we have a lot of it, it's a very common coolant for nuclear reactors, and it's a natural neutron absorber by default, but, you see, if we were, say, oh, I don't know, a little braver, if we swap that out for something that can get hotter, something that can absorb more energy from the reactor rods, we can do a lot more work. Like, oh, I don't know, say, the molten metal fast reactors used in the Alpha class? And now, see, we can start producing some real powerful energy. Enough to power crazy shields or nuclear bazookas, or whatever the hell we so desire. Gigawatts and gigawatts per second. All while sporting so much tonnage for radiation shielding that Daisaku is completely safe from radiation poisoning, and you'll be too unless you insist on standing under him for hours on end. That is why Giant Robo is fucking great. Decades of power. Tons of room for shielding, tons of space for the main reactor. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of nuclear energy. For you see, as I've mentioned before, Mecha are the mechanical, humanoid new gods born from human imagination and technology. And nuclear power is the power of the gods. Isn't that right, Grand Doug Fusion? That's right, Palomino. It's an atomic era. We must take the reins of nuclear power and its responsibility. All who oppose us must fear our steel colossi and their radioactive hearts. Yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee-yee